can I piggyback now on what uh, the vice mayor was saying? I love, love, love the idea of permanent supportive housing. I love the residential use restriction. I love the attached property also being included for, what is it, 50 years. I'm thrilled to hear about the um, success we've had in coordinated entry from uh, an equity standpoint. I do have concerns though. And if I had to lump my concerns in baskets, I would put them in into two. I have concerns about um, transparency that this process has uh, uh, not provided. And secondly, also equity. So I'll go ahead and start with the transparency. I have real concerns that when we made this necessary pivot, we did not issue an RFP. I spoke to uh, City Attorney Branham and he gave me well-reasoned legal analysis as to why that would not be required. And I'll happily accept that, but no one has given me a reason why, even though it wasn't required, why we couldn't still do it anyway. So when I asked how we ended up with the um, proposed partners from out of state, essentially I was told that staff reached out and had heard good things about the organization. So immediately to me, what I heard was the good old boy network taking place. And so by definition to me, the process we undertook was not equitable. I do have concerns about doling our limited ARPA funds to a for-profit entity based in California. And based on my own research of that entity, I don't find that entity to actually be um, very diverse. So that's my first concern. Secondly, delving into equity. Can I ask you just a clarification? Are you talking about Shangri-La or Step Up? Um, the California-based. So that's Shangri-La. Well, but we're not giving any money to Shangri-La. That's why I'm just asking. My point is how we chose them in the first place. Right. I mean, picking up the phone and calling somebody, it just seems to me that we can, are we saying we can do an RFP when we need to, but in other cases, we don't really have to. Again, I don't want to get all into it, but it was not particularly transparent, I don't think. And it, as a practical matter, excluded other partners as a result. Now, moving ahead to a discussion about the equity component. Before Kathy Ball left, she gave me the same numbers that Emily gave as far as the demographic breakup or makeup, I should say, of the unhoused in our community. And essentially 30% are of color, roughly 24% are um, African-American. Uh, you know, I'm surprised to, to learn that, but I'll definitely accept it. It's just that that's not what I, I see. So then when I requested the demographic makeup of those who were actually housed in the Ramada, I was not surprised to learn that of 120 that had come through, only 11 had been Black. And so what is that? That's around like 9% in a, a community where only 9% of the total residents are Black, but 25% or let me be more accurate, 24% of the unhoused are Black, I would have actually expected a much, much, much larger percentage. And today, my understanding is that of the 80 folks who are um, residing at Ramada, again, uh, what is it? Nine are african Americans, so around 11%. That troubles me. Um, there's something about our system that even given our best um, efforts, we're not reaching the neediest of the needy. I can't in good conscience um, brush those people aside for something that I actually support. Um, so I'm hoping Mr. Lipka can discuss with me how we get to serve the people we most need to serve, even among um, those in the community who we normally look at as being the neediest, because the neediest of the neediest are not being served. I'll back up and await your response.
Would you like me to respond at this point? Yes, I'd like anybody to respond. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll defer to city staff if they if they'd like me to respond. Go ahead and please go ahead. <laughs> Well, I think you you raise a very important issue because issues of uh, equity and access are very significant in the homeless population. We're talking about people all who a large percentage also have a disability as well. And I think the system you're talking about, I, I can't speak to Asheville, but um, from my perspective, the provider community in many cities has an inherent bias built in because much of the providers are center-based and wait for individuals to come to them, which really predisposes, it self-selects the people who are most able to get from point A where they are to the provider organization to access that help. And, and the people who are most disabled who have the least access are less able to navigate those bureaucratic boundaries to get into to access that. So from, from my perspective, that's why Step Up is a community-based organization that my, my staff, I have 350 staff and, and all of our service staff don't sit in an office. They go out into the community, they go in the washes, they go in the alleys, they go in the forest where homeless people are to, to find those individuals. And there is a, an assessment tool that we use that actually has some biases built in. Um, but we really do uh, advocate for a, a, an assessment tool that really is going to look at some of those issues that, that you're talking about. Additionally, I can say that we've worked with some communities, for example, uh, we've done these permanent supportive housing projects in Santa Monica. We do not only the services, but the property management, which handles the lease up function. So we really want to serve you as a community in terms of what are your priorities and preferences. So for example, in, in the city of Santa Monica, they put a local preference so that we're housing just people who have been homeless for a certain number of years in those permanent supportive housing units. The city could also say to us as part of the, the lease up process, you know, we're gonna use multiple criteria because the vouchers will have some criteria, the assessment tool, will have some criteria. The city can have their own criteria to say things like, we want to make sure that somebody has been homeless for X number of years in Asheville to be considered for these units. The city can also say, we want you to mirror as best as possible without violating uh, fair housing, um, that the demographics of the individuals who are housed in this building match the demographics of the homeless population. And so we can't, probably do that exactly, but we can use that as criteria that you dictate to us. So we're really interested in being a solution for you as a city and to incorporate the the very, very stakeholder interests and preferences. But certainly the, the, the city staff and the city council would be a very important uh, stakeholder for us to try and try and meet that. I, I, I'm not sure if you were in the meeting, uh, the initial meeting about a month ago, but this model in its entirety, bringing in a private investor and Andy Myers, the CEO of Shangri-La is also here on the call. We partner with them and we partner with very few uh, developers. We're a developer too. And, and, and the reason is, is that creating this housing usually is a five-year process. And so people die, the people who need this life-saving housing with supportive services die before the buildings are ever completed. So for us, we're disrupting this system that really is built around all the investors, typically the government investors, which is why it takes so long and costs so much. So we're bringing a solution to you that really is intended to radically change how quickly housing is developed and how much it costs to a jurisdiction. I mean, we're bringing to you a solution. We're talking about a year or so to have this housing online and to have people housed. We're talking about a minimal cost to the city. That's a disruption of a system that to me has significant systemic discrimination built into it because it doesn't ever consider the end consumer, the homeless individual. Uh, in, in a racially diverse population of homeless individuals to get this life-saving help.
Thank you so much for that. Emil, I was wondering when we have these demographic breakdowns, I'm not seeing a lot of mention of the Latinx community. Is that anywhere in our data too that I just overlooked? I didn't include that. Um, I'd be happy to pull that and send it to you. We do collect ethnicity data in, um, in the homeless management information system. 